Well, hello. I'm going to make a quick uh, on-camera blurb before I launch into the end of my treatment of Christian Zionism. Um, I just want to say that very soon, what's happening now in the world is, is uh, pretty scary because every day um, we are more and more limited to the kind of information that we are allowed to engage with. And soon, the powerful people, the players of the great game, are going to have even more powerful AI tools and algorithms and so on. And we've already monetized ourselves and domesticated ourselves through sharing our data on social media and elsewhere with the world. The idea that China's more in control of their population because of WeChat than Americans are because of Amazon and Facebook and uh, all of our platforms is ridiculous. Um, they, they know us better than we know ourselves. They, they can do whatever they want whenever they feel like they need to do it. And these platforms are censoring posts now more than ever. So you have to constantly request a review if you put something up uh, about the other side that they don't want people to engage in. And it's not to say that you're being revolutionary or that you're spreading lies or, uh, you know, bots from dictatorships or whatever. There's so many contradictions and so much hypocrisy. But very soon, we're not going to be able to really, you know, engage with, quote unquote, the truth anymore. Um, it's the end game now. There's a lot of things happening. And in order to keep the game going in the financial markets and to maintain the profits first ethic, they're going to have to become more and more draconian. And by they, I just mean you know, people who benefit the most from the status quo. And that's a lot of people. So with this Zionism thing, I think there's going to be a day where, where you can't refer to Zionism in a negative light in any way. It'll be outlawed, you know. You just won't be able to say that maybe uh, this ideology is kind of wrong in some way. Homeland security is homeland insecurity now. And I think that's across the board, whether you're talking about uh, countries in East Asia or Eurasia or countries in the Middle East. I don't think I can even name a name anymore. If I say the name of a North African country or a, a country in the Levant, uh, or a country in the Middle East, or an Arab country, or a country somewhere between a country in the Middle East and Pakistan, or something, you know, whatever. I'm sorry, I said Pakistan. Oh my God, you know, you're flagged. And you can't put an honest title on a video or a post anymore, um, because the algorithms will pick it up, the AIs will pick it up, and they'll say, mm, we don't think this is good. And that what they mean is they don't think it's good for you to see this information. So you're not mature. You, you don't have agency. You don't have knowledge. You can't think for yourself. You're not free. Um, you don't have good judgment or critical thinking skills. So they have to be very careful to curate the kind of information that you're allowed to see. Now, most people just watch TV, so, you know, I'm not worried about them. They, they're going to think what they're supposed to think. They're on a steady diet of propaganda, and that shapes their worldview and their actions and activities, their, what annoys them, what they hate, what they disagree with. Um, it's not really that well thought out or thought through. You know, It's just like you take it for granted that your beliefs are correct without interrogating where your beliefs come from. 
So I'm going to go ahead and, and finish this uh, Christian Zionism thing and leave it at that. And in the future, I think on Facebook Globe Hackers page, I'm just going to publish maybe a weekly uh, newsletter from my blog with links to information so that I can post it and you can go through it and look at what you want to look at without Facebook telling me that you can't say that kind of stuff. You know, if you post a video that has Putin's face on it, they will take it down. If you post the same video without the, the thumbnail, the picture, uh, the image, <laughs> they'll leave it up. So they haven't gotten to the point yet where the AI can read the whole paragraph and make a quick judgment about the video description being evil or wrong or against the grain. Uh, but it's going to come to that pretty soon. Um, YouTube and other platforms will be able to go through word for word what's on there, the content, and they'll decide whether or not you are mature enough to handle that information. Because, as we well know, you can't handle the truth. So, um, yeah, business as usual must be protected. Uh, there's no price too dear, even nuclear war and nuclear winter. At the end of the day, if I can't control it, nobody can. It's like uh, Stanley Kowalski, is that his name? <laughs> A streetcar named Desire, or honor killings and whatnot. Anyway, I, don't, I can't pass judgment on everybody's um, thinking or worldview or background. People think what they think and, and all that. What I was trying to do with my page and some newsletters and whatnot was just curate a, a different stream of information that might challenge um, your algorithms a bit and allow you to see some perspectives that you might not be exposed to. But of course, it's not comprehensive because I don't go to the Korean press and the Latvian press. And I don't really know that much about intellectual influencers in Europe. I know a few, but you know, I'm an American, so I kind of see the world through that lens, even though I haven't lived in America for decades. I'm still an American, so I see it that way. Um, I have my Irish streak, but by, by far, I'm, I'm a privileged white American. <laughs> so I'm just saying I'm going to have to find a way to share because I want to, because I'm compelled to, and because I enjoy learning about current events. And so I'll share it, and maybe a few people will be interested, and maybe not. Uh, I'm not making a huge effort to promote myself, and I don't want to be an influencer. I just want to share with people who are interested in what I have to share and the way I have to share it. There are so many talented, beautiful, intelligent young people producing incredible content, and I could never compete with them. They're young, they're energetic, they're bright. Uh, they know their subjects inside and out. I don't agree with all of them, but I admire them and respect them for the work they put in as creators and for the job that they do. And I'm glad that we have access to their work. Of course, a lot of it's demonetized or uh, put lower in the feed and whatnot because it goes against the status quo. I watched Max Blumenthal from The Gray Zone, and of course, they're not going to allow him to be seen that much. <laughs> you know, he's out there. You can you can see him on YouTube, but it's discouraged. You know, um, we can't talk about what's wrong with our with our world, with our myth, the American myth. Um, it's going to be completely. They're going to put a lid on it completely soon. Um, there will come a day where it's beyond Orwellian. Uh, Newspeak is already in every headline of almost every mainstream publication. Um, I published a piece where, where I had tons and tons of headlines. I was just pointing out the, the language. I won't go into it now. I did a lot of work on that, and that was um, taken off of Facebook. 
completely like no you can't do that um so maybe i'll put that in a on my blog or something it doesn't matter a lot of people do this point this out and i, I follow a lot of journalists that i respect and and trust so it's not like it's my original idea or anything i was just um you know putting a bunch of different stuff together that i found we won't notice it when it happens we'll still think we're being told um, we will believe that how we're being programmed is correct and right and as it should be the best of all possible worlds and we will feel superior to the other guys and we're not going to coordinate across con- culture we're not going to partner across culture to solve problems to get rid of nuclear uh, warheads nuclear weapons uh, we're not going to stop war we're not going to make peace i wrote a thing this morning about where are all the peacemakers people uh, think they're religious christian zionists and they have very weird ideas about peace i don't know how they get that out of scripture even if you're going to look at old new testament and say well the new testament uh takes care of the old testament because you know Jesus did what he had to do and it's all good now all those nasty days are gone uh you can get to god through jesus or whatever maybe i'm not asking people to believe anything i don't i'm an agnostic um i like wisdom traditions because there's wisdom in the wisdom traditions you know there's something in lao tzu and confucius and uh martin luther king and malcolm x and mahatma gandhi and uh hinduism and uh buddhism and christianity and whatever jainism there's wisdom in it and if you understand the context of the wisdom how it came out when it came out and what it represents even cave paintings in France um i think you can learn profound lessons from it about how to live i like stoicism as i've said before i like spinoza's treatment of god <laughs> but it's not the only thing i'm always reading philosophy and learning new stuff so I really don't know where I stand. You know, I don't have some dogmatic uh perspective. I don't have a canon to have faith in, whether it's a Buddhist canon or orthodox Christian canon. I just know that there's wisdom in it. Learning about history and art and culture is a good thing for me. Um and I'm not prescribing that anybody do anything. You're going to do what you got to do. and i respect that again i'm just saying the day is coming when you will be fed only what they want you to see now it's been like that for hundreds of years maybe throughout uh history from the dawn of civilizations between the two rivers <laughs> in in ancient Babylon or wherever the Indus Valley what wherever you want to throw a dart at at a timeline whatever location um any culture you know if you're a samurai you have to believe certain things right you have to if you were a a warrior in World War II from Japan you'd have to believe that the emperor was divine And of course now I don't think people think that anymore. Or most Japanese people don't believe that the emperor is divine. Maybe there's a few. Anyway, uh guard your mind carefully. Um feed it good stuff, which basically means you're going to have to do some work and read books. And um if you have the strength to fight the peace revolution and sacrifice something for it become a peacemaker and you can only do that in community with other people no one can do it alone 
There are no superheroes, only people, members of social groups, of organizations, cultures, families who can choose, hopefully, the way they want to spend their time and make their leaders understand that they had better listen or else. Most leaders in the States, once they get elected, they're co-opted by the machine, the party machine, the oligopoly, uh, you know, big business, donors, whatever. <laughs> I mean, it's just like that. So it doesn't really matter if you're a progressive or a conservative or whatever. You are going to be um, brought into the system and it will control you. It's going to give you a little latitude to pretend to LARP like you're an independent leader who's serving a constituency. But at the end of the day, you're not. Whether you're Obama or Ocasio-Cortez or George W. Bush or Donald J. Trump or anybody. And so... You know, until you decide you want to participate in democracy and be democratic, and, um, and then you're going to have to fight because there will be people that disagree with you. And to make peace, you have to make people understand you. And uh, hopefully, if you can find some common ground and understanding, you'll be able to... Um, Make peace. So what's so funny about peace, love, and understanding, people? All right, this section, done. Bouliam T out. Thank you for listening. Okay, here I am at the computer. Now, I'm not promoting Amazon or anything. I have bought books from Amazon. I wish I was going to the Tattered Cover in Denver back in the day or some other cool bookstore like City Lights in San Francisco or the many bookstores in Washington, D.C. <laughs> There's so many good bookstores, and I wish I was going to them and browsing. But anyway, we do it this way now. So I had a quick look just to let you know before they criminalize mentioning Zionism in anything other than a positive light. I'll take you through. Now, this one I'm looking forward to because Elon Pop is a great... Uh, writer, very interesting guy. So um, lobbying Z for Zionism on both sides of the Atlantic. It's coming out on Friday, September 20. So you have to wait for that one, but you can pre-order it if you want. Essays on anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, and the left. Um, the Hundred Years' War on Palestine, Rashid Khalidi. I've read that one. Gaza and Crisis, The Jewish State. There's just so much literature out there looking at Zionism from many angles, and this is the one that I was recommending, A Short History of Christian Zionism from the Reformation to the 21st Century. So think about that. The Reformation, Martin Luther, to the 21st Century. That's a big survey, and it's really awesome, actually. It's a great book. Uh, the New Christian Zionism, Fresh Perspectives on Israel and the Land. Anyway, just showing you there's a ton of books on Zionism, right? There's nothing new, but Zionism and anti-Semitism and so on are being weaponized now. So we're getting to a point in the world where we can't talk about these things. Uh, you have to have one point of view, one perspective, it has to agree with the empire, uh, with business as usual, status quo, power. And if it doesn't, you're in trouble. So look at this, man. It's like 13 pages of this stuff. I've read this one, Why Nations Succeed and Fail, by Ray Dalio. And uh, he mentions Zionism. But anyway, you know. So here's my book list again on my Cospelon uh, blog site and it's got a lot of different things you know if books could kill is a review uh, podcast same with frappes and fiction and um, st john's reading list of great books curriculum that's really interesting 
eco-socialist bookshelf. <laughs> so anyway, I've got a lot of books here that I've read and that I think are pretty good or interesting. I, I didn't put all the books up. To, you know, when I was young, I was reading mostly metaphysics and literature. And, I, you know, I got into the nonfiction thing back in like 2000 or something. When I started, well, in the 90s, when I started wanting to do business, you know, I, I would read tons of business books. And, uh, and then I got into science and stuff, and I was reading non, more nonfiction. So anyway, there's a ton of stuff in here that's, uh, I think, interesting. And so if you're going to protect yourself from the algorithms and the propaganda, the content that they want you to munch on day in and day out to program you to fit into their game so that they can make profits while you uh, struggle. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. If you think the world's just going swimmingly and, you know, you love the Home Depot in your neighborhood and it's all great, um, okay, that's fine. I Just don't listen to it. But here's a bunch of really good content that you can read, and it might just open your mind a little bit. And it's not conspiracy stuff. Uh, the material, material world is interesting. It's just about all the stuff that we need and where we get it. Um, and without it, we're nothing. As well as, uh, what's that book called? Um, anyway. So I just wanted to share that real quick. And then we'll go into, uh, what am I, where am I? Um, varieties of Christian Zionism. So where was I? Okay, I'm at the top now. I would just wanted to quickly go through the prosperity gospel. And no matter how fringe you think these groups are, there are millions of people around the world that are into it. And uh, they really believe this stuff. I have friends in my extended family and in my family that believe in the end of days, the late great planet Earth kind of apocalypse. <laughs> And so they're not really worried about anything because they have salvation through Christ. So who gives a damn if there's a nuclear war with Putin? Maybe that's what God intended, right? So why bother worrying about it? You know, just go to work and have fun and watch Netflix and so on. So, yeah, here's the prosperity as evidence of divine favor, right? So... You're a multi-billionaire or millionaire, not because your dad passed on generational wealth to you and you grew that wealth uh, by through capital on capital returns, investments, um, but because God wanted you to be rich. And that's a beautifully comfortable way to look at the world, right? If you're fortunate, God wanted you to be fortunate. And if you're unfortunate, it's your fault. You're fat because it's your fault. You're addicted because it's your fault. You're poor because it's your fault. And so we have all these narratives about working hard and pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps and stuff like that. And they apply Old Testament premises to modern nations. And they take the scripture out of uh, context. So. Here's some criticisms of nations-based prosperity theology. So it's, it's interesting that, you know, the city on the hill, the United States, is favored. And a lot of people in America believe that it's favored by God, right? And if, if you believe that, 
why would you care about climate change? I mean, whatever. God wanted us to have oil and gas, and we have it, a lot of it. We're powerful, and we can uh, exploit the resources of other countries, and God wanted it that way. So they say it's a misinterpretation of, of Scripture, the critics. These promises were specific to Israel under the old covenant and not intended for all nations. Prosperity gospel critics, many theologians, criticize the prosperity gospel for its overemphasis on material wealth. Materialism, right? And there's ethical and social issues, like I said before, blaming the victim, blaming nations for their own suffering. You know, it's not because we go over there and do regime change coups and sponsor proxy wars and color revolutions and rip your minerals out of your land and pay off the politicians. <laughs> it's none of that. It's just that, you know, uh, you're savages, you're idiots. You know, all these people with their bell curves and their IQs and, well, it's just the Asians are just smarter than other people. I think it's very... Uh, erroneous on so many levels, but anyway, it's also unhelpful, and um, and it ends badly for everybody at the end of the day, because we don't manage resources in the right way, where we cherish and revere and care for uh, the resources that we have. <laughs> we just want to commodify them and turn them into products and sell them for a quick buck. It ignores or minimizes structural issues like uh, systemic inequality, historical exploitation, and global economic dynamics that contribute to national prosperity or poverty, right? I always think we're not really addressing the systemic and cultural and structural issues that create the world we're in. And of course, if you think everything's perfect, um, then never mind. But so many people just say, you know, God wants it so, right? Anyway, there's a lot more on this. I'm just going to stop because what's the point? Um, you can go online. You can use chat GPT-4 or you can use Google or you can buy some books. You can learn about it and think for yourself what it means to you. But it's a thing. It's a big deal. And I think this idea of, well, all of these ideas and ideologies are going to come to an end because what we have now isn't sustainable. We live in a world with limited resources, and we're damaging it badly now. So all the technological progress and intellectual progress, philosophic, whatever, um, it comes to naught if we can't think about protecting uh, the integrity and the rights and the health of future generations. And if we're just going to extinct life on Earth, um, it's not going to end well. And it's kind of sad because, you know, a big, huge asteroid hit somewhere off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula, and because of the ground that it hit in the shallow water, it almost extincted everything. But some animals that could burrow under the ground and so, some animals in the sea survived. And from that, we evolved. And we're here as homo sapiens for a little while. And then we're not. But it's not because of an asteroid that hit a cosmic event a real act of God, you might say, but because we fucked it up. And that's kind of sad. In my book, that's tragic. So cultural, I mean, Zionism is a thing, whether it's Jewish or whatever, and Christian Zionism is a thing. It's a big deal to people. A lot of people think that righteous beliefs give them license to do whatever they want to do. And we're forced to go along with it because we have to pay the rent. Anyway, think about this stuff. I'm going to leave it at that. 
Yeah, I could go on and on. I got copious notes on Christian Zionism. But I'm going to stop this topic for now. I hope I can squeeze it in just before um, the West, <laughs> the, the American Empire says, you can't talk about Christian Zionism, dude. It's off limits. Unless you have something positive to say, shut the fuck up. All right, I'm done. Take good care. Have a nice weekend. Bliam T. Out.